Before we go ahead and get started, uh, you see Brian's got some sunglasses on here today. I thought maybe he could explain a little bit while he's, while he's got his sunglasses on. That's yeah, probably yeah. a good way yeah, to get I'm, started. I'm, and I'm, I'm not trying to look like Puff Daddy here. <laughs> this is, uh, I, I got a concussion about 10 days ago and I didn't do a very good job taking care of it because I didn't know I had one until a few days ago. And so anyway, I'm just very light sensitive, so I apologize. Yeah. I, I also keep losing my train of thought and my memory's not so good. So any, <laughs> keep, the comp, keep the questions not too complex. All right. All right. Okay, so let's start off with a question yeah. for you. Go back to the beginning. Yeah. You know, what was the seed of this great idea and mm -hmm. how did you germinate it? How did you make it grow? Yeah, I mean, it was uh, kind of a classic entrepreneur story where there's sort of a problem in your own life that you're trying to solve. I, we had just gotten done selling IntelliQuest, which is a public company that I was the CEO of, and it was about a, you know, typical 10-year stretch of 15-hour days and uh, wanted to take a little bit of time off and was traveling with my family um, around the world. And we liked, we, you know, we had kids and we really liked renting houses. And it was pretty easy to do in the U.S., but as we went sort of other places around the world, we found um, that we had a really hard time, you know, gathering information about available properties that were out there, being able to compare that information. There were sites all over the world, but all of them were different. Most of them were very low quality. And so, you know, just when I got back from that trip, uh, the home always started really with a sentence and a notion, which is, you know, let's go out and build the Expedia for vacation rentals. And in fact, when I first went to Austin Ventures with this, that, I mean, that was it. That was the business plan. We're going to build the Expedia. I thought I shut this thing off. Um, of vacation rentals. And, and, and so um, uh, we then, uh, AV committed a bunch of money on the spot, primarily because IntelliQuest, you know, had given them like a 25 to, you know, to, to 30x return. Um, and, and, and so we put together a very small team, starting with somebody who's not here, who should be here, Carl Shepard, uh, who is my co-founder. Um, Carl's a terrific guy, he used to be CEO of Texas Monthly, um, CEO, CEO, CEO of Hoover's. Uh, and Carl had a lot of experience with acquisitions, which do come into play later. But, but really, Carl and I just set out to understand the industry in the beginning. Um, we, we had this notion that what the industry needed was something that looked a lot like the hotel industry. So from the beginning, we thought, we'll come in, we're tech guys, we'll build an incredible platform, everybody will be able to book properties online, uh, and we'll go from there. Now, Homeway does do that today, but back in those days, as it turned out, after four or five months of research and talking to people and customers all over the country, uh, we learned that at least for that moment in time, a much more simple model uh, was appropriate, which was just a straight up classified listing site, you know, sellers come on and list what they've got, buyers sort of sort, sort through all that. And by, if you tried to sort of insert some kind of percentage fee or something into the equation, at least at that time, the market wasn't going to accept that. And we, the big aha moment for the company, because we, you know, we spent this period of months just really needing not how we're going to do it. We knew it was a big opportunity. Uh, it turned out to be a bigger opportunity. Than this is like 2005, right, in that time? Two, that, well, we started working on 2004. Okay. We didn't close our first set of deals until 2005. Yeah. Um, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Did you think back then you'd be able to get the company public at some point? Was that an objective? Or uh, it was just yeah. a great idea that you were no. going to aggregate and go build it? No, no, I mean, as somebody who'd just done a public company and then Carl comes in and he has public company experience, I think, I think while we weren't necessarily building it to be a public company, our expectation was that we were going to tr build a company worth, I, I think at the time, I remember thinking about it, 500 million or greater was sort of our objective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as it turned out, the, the market was a lot bigger than we thought, and the company got a lot bigger, and the value got a lot bigger. Uh, but, but we had ambitions from the beginning, and you know, you, you, w whether we had venture capital investors, so you know, at some point in their life cycle, they're going to have to liquidate. We know that, so that means you're either going to have to go down a public road or a sale of the company road. We didn't really have a preference for either. I probably had a slight preference for not going public because mm -hmm. I'd been a public company CEO for four years. Yeah, and you don't usually want to do it yeah. again. And we'll talk later. We can talk, we can talk later about yeah. you know how we made that decision. Yeah. So, Lori, let me ask you a question. So, you 
you, you become part of this team. What year was it that you became part of the team? Uh, early 2007. Okay, so just at the time when the company's beginning to ramp, it's mm -hmm. done a couple of acquisitions, mm -hmm. it's trying to stitch some things together, right. trying to build this platform. Uh, as Chief People Officer, you had a big responsibility in terms of helping Brian build the team and also establishing the culture. Talk a little bit about what the challenges were back in that time frame. Yeah, so when I joined, it was uh, May of 2007, and um, we had uh, the VRBO acquisition had just taken place in Q4 of the prior year, um, and there were also, um, we had about 150 employees in four countries. Um, so there was a whole bunch of stuff going on, but not a lot of structure. Um, so um, Lynn and I spent the first couple of weekends reconciling stock options to board grants. Um, <laughs> sound familiar? Um, you know, and I'm like, wait, wait, wait. And then there was this weird little option plan that had just applied to one deal and all of these things that were uh, not working. Uh, but the one thing that was working was that um, Brian and Carl had really brought on a very um, A player experienced team of executives. So Lynn was already there. Carl was already there. I hadn't figured out how to find Melissa yet, um, but she showed up shortly thereafter. Um, Ross Burdorf was there as our CTO. Um, so we, um, I think the, the smartest thing to do, particularly given the trajectory that the company was going, was to um, stack the deck with very senior talent at the beginning. Um, and importantly, it was very senior open-minded talent. So the open-minded talent allowed people to come together and, and build a good company. Um, in the next, the, the range of challenges though, um, included how are we going to grow? What are we going to do internationally? How do we get our culture to be consistent? How do we get um, all of these groups to um, share the same values? Um, and so we started working on that and um, started picking a few things that were um, global truths. For example? Um, for example, um, compensation cycle. You know, we had um, ad hoc compensation cycles before then. Um, and I did the math because math always helps me prove my people points. Um, our average increase before doing a, a focal point compensation cycle was 17%. On like, you know, 15% of our people, which, you know, might make sense. But when we started doing our focal point review, then we were able to look at everybody, not just the squeaky wheels. Um, and we we're able to be fair, you know, in all of our regions, the UK, France, Germany, as well as here in Austin. Um, and that really helped um, everybody get the comp philosophy down. It really helped us look at everybody fairly, and it really helped the executives have some sense of tempo and pace instead of just going pell-mell at, at the work, which is what startups generally do. And just to, one of the challenges with all that is the fact that we did want to build an international company very quickly. In fact, when we opened our doors the first day, we took in capital. We acquired companies both in the US and the UK, uh, but we had plans to very aggressively go around the world, find the biggest vacation rental players in those markets consistent, who, who had sort of values and a philosophy consistent with how we wanted to run the business uh, and bring them in. And so, you know, cr creating a multinational organization almost from scratch <laughs> just creates a whole lot of challenges for, you know, for accounting, for legal, for HR, certainly, and other things. Yeah, so why don't you guys jump in? You look like yeah, you're dropping at the bit. Yeah, I think Lori um, put this out of her, her memory banks because it was so painful, but <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even know how many employees we had for a long oh. time. You know, it, it, because, I had a rough idea. Yeah, we had a rough idea, but we would have to yeah. once a month. The process was send an email around the world to all these different offices, say how many people do you have, and then somebody took that email and they said we have 150 or we have 130 right. or we have we had not no including idea. students or not including students. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, so we're, <laughs> it was very decentralized, and so the lack of structure is um, an understatement. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah. that must have driven you crazy as the chief legal Yes. Officer. I mean, well, we were fortunate you, because we had a group of super intelligent, dynamic, and very fast-moving employees, and they were always working on a bajillion things at one time. And so the biggest challenge for me and my team was not only to stay in the loop on what was going on, but to try to get ahead of it because I had to try to make sure it was legal, compliant, and then as we were looking to go public, making sure that we were planning ahead of time for any public company disclosures. So um, I don't know if you guys remember this, but I formed this group, and it was called the Risk Office Committee, which had the cool acronym of Rock. The Rock. 
And so it was this cross-functional. So yeah, it was. Everyone wanted to be a part of it. It was a cross-functional team. Me. Yeah, yeah. We left Brian out of it because it would have made him depressed because we talked about all of the risks and stuff. But it was a cross-functional team. It was me and Lori and just a representative from all of the functions across the organization. And that enabled us to real time say, OK, what's really going on? And then we brainstormed on how do we mitigate those risks or reduce those risks. So that was one of the tools that I came up with. I think uh, from, a, from the M&A strategy, one of the most effective things that Brian and Carl did, though, was to make sure that we put our own leadership in at every site. So um, um, having done roll-ups before, where the former owner stayed for an earnout or they had some um, incentive, um, those situations in my past have allowed the, the culture of the ac acquired company to continue um, and sometimes allowed the agenda of the former owner to continue in a way that's not necessarily in alignment with the company. It might not be bad, but it's not aligned because it's their baby. So, um, so one of the things that had already started, and I think that the UK group was you know, probably your use case for doing this quickly, right. um, was um, we would, um, <laughs> exactly, we, we would, um, during the acquisition conversation, it was clear that the founder was going to go live on an island and, and retire. Um, we made it clear to the employees that there would be a transition period, and then we hired in uh, general managers who uh, were aligned with our agenda um, and who were happy to come to Austin and thrilled to be part of the team, um, and that allowed us a lot less friction in terms of getting everybody to go the same direction. Yeah, so let's kind of, I guess we're not going to flash forward, Ed, but you joined 2007. The, the circa of the time period y'all are talking about is 2007, 2008, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, something I learned in preparing for the panel was that HomeAway initially was thinking about going public in 2008. So we're talking about environment that I think you all are describing as quite a bit of chaos and trying to get everything going and moving in the right direction to wanting to participate in this financial world that required order and statistics and uh, risk abatement strategies. So Lynn why, don't, Lynn, why don't you talk about kind of the whole process of how you decided or the timing of, of going public and then what happened from that? Great. So um, yeah, that, that's right. We were growing extremely fast going through, as um, Lori and Melissa mentioned, a, a time where we were everyone was running really fast. It was very clear that we were building something that had a lot of value. So we were super excited about the outcome. And so were all the bankers, and they were courting us. And, and we had, well, why not go public, right? And, and as some of you, if you're operators in the room, you, know, you get courted by the bankers. They tell you how wonderful you are and how much money you can make, and you kind of fall into that. And so in the fall of 2007, we actually went through an entire bake-off um, where we had to present our um, plans to the bankers and then they presented to us and we picked a team and embarked on filing to go public. Now this was pre-Jobs Act so and that's an important part of the story because when that, what was happening that we were seeing on the management side and on the board side was that there was a lot of volatility in the stock market in the fall of 2007 and the winter of 2007. So I'm not going to say that we were that we could see the future and that we knew exactly what was going to happen, but we were just seeing the volatility. So around January of 2008, we were going, do we really want to jump out into that? And we were full on preparing S1s and in the background working on controls and everything else. And we ended up, um, there was a, another investor with the Tiger Group wanted to also kind of jump in pre-IPO. And so that kind of started us thinking. And make an investment. And make an investment in us. And we didn't need the, the, the money, but, but we were just looking, well, let's let them invest. That would help set the, um, the valuation. And so they came in and did that. And we just, at, really, I think we just had a heart to heart at one point around February or March and said, do we really want to jump out in this? And the interesting learning for me was that the bankers still wanted us to file the S1 because they wanted us to be out there, right? And, and we said, if we follow S1, then we are telling all of our competitors the world, we, we are letting everyone know all the details about our business and for what. And so we held the ground and we said, no, we're not gonna do that. Yeah, I, I just would also say on the, on the timing of that 2018 piece, we had just come off a big acquisition of a company called VRBO. We had loaded that thing up with about 100 million in debt, which for a small growing venture backed company, you know, was, uh, was a little bit scary. And we saw all these other acquisitions on the horizon. So, the, I mean, the reason we talked about going public wasn't so much 
you know, to jump in a, a great market or to get liquidity for shareholders, anything like that. It was like, we knew we needed to amass a pile of capital. She was right. When Tiger came in, we didn't need the money because we were cash flow positive to survive, but we definitely needed the money to do what we had to do. And uh, it ended up, I mean, that was, a, a, you know, quite a memory in 2008 because uh, we, we ultimately um, ended up raising about 250 million bucks. As it turned out in 2008, by the summer of 2008, it was pretty clear that private uh, equity was valuing uh, you know, companies like ours much higher than the public markets. And so we sort of made that trade. But uh, our deal actually closed in on October 7th, right? Of two, I thought it was two, the 23rd. Yeah. 23rd in 2008. Yeah. Right. So, so they finalized the deal, I think, on right. the 7th, which was the, which was the lowest point of the NASDAQ. And of course, I got a call the night before from our investors. We had a pretty good valuation and a lot of money. And our lead investor, TCV, called me and said, you know, look, we just had a partner meeting and, uh, you know, the markets for tech have come down, you know, 25, 30% in the last few months. And I know we had a deal, but, you know, we want to do this deal at, you know, 30, 35% less. And I, I, I just said to this guy, Woody, uh, I said, Woody, um, you know, if you go back on this deal, I'm not coming back to you. I got two other guys who are ready to do this at the same price wasn't really true. And, <laughs> uh, and within one phone call, he kind of caved and just said, OK, well, my partner said I had to try. And I said, listen. <laughs> you know, but, but my explanation to him was, listen, you guys say you're long-term investors. You're investing in the long term. What's happening right now, this month in 2008, right. has nothing to do with long-term valuations for companies like this. Yeah. And so if you're telling me your thesis has changed, then that means you've got a short-term focus, not a long-term focus, and I don't want that. So, uh, but but it was a but it was a scary time because, um, you know, during the financial crisis, American Capital, who we had borrowed a hundred million dollars from, um, was going under, right? And so, if and so they had lots of ways they could call the loan. We were sure they were going to call the loan. If that deal hadn't closed. I don't know what would happen. We would have been, we would have been pretty screwed. So we, we, just in the nick of time, we got it done. It, it, you know, for those of you financially in the room, we had covenants in, in this $100 million loan. And the covenant said we could only do three or four million of CapEx a year or some, some number like that. But then we maybe had EBITDA cash flow of, we had to at least have 10 million of EBITDA cash flow on some period of time. We, we were generating three and four times the amount of EBITDA, of free cash flow because of the acquisitions in the business. But because we were growing so fast, we needed five million of, cap, of CapEx instead of three million. So because of gap accounting, if I could have just expensed all of our computers, it would have been fine. But I had to technically go back to them and say, hey, we're generating three and four times the amount of bottom line cash, but we need, we need to buy more computers, literally. We need to buy more computers and offices and everything. And they're like, no, pay off the loan. Yeah. yeah. So they were holding, and in, in, in the, in the, in the months kind of preceding that, I don't think we were reading what was going on with them. A lot of this is understood in hindsight. Because they needed the money. Right. Yeah. We, right. we didn't necessarily they have needed insight liquidity. Into, into their liquidity. They ended up going under right. a and, month and later. So yeah. They were yeah. looking at us as anything we asked to do, they really just needed the capital back. And so <laughs> it was crazy. And I will say this about Brian. In between you know, finalizing the deal but actually closing it, we were continuing to go through very intensive due diligence involved the entire team. And on more than one occasion, you walked by my desk and you would look at me and you said, are they going to close this? Are they going to close this? And it was because of what was going on externally. It, it, had, it had nothing to do with anything going wrong with the company or due diligence, but the markets were so scary during that month of October. Yeah. Yeah. So, so to sort of summarize this, you most people think of IPO as a... Uh, liquidity event for investors and for management team, but you were really looking at an IPO at that time. Not that it didn't capital. include those elements, but you were really looking at it as a financing event, which is really what an IPO Cheapest is. Cheapest capital to be. possible. Yeah. Right. So so the markets weren't right. The company wasn't ready. Um, um, you had access to capital through these other investors. You were able to get rid of the loan. And then it was really another three years before you actually went public. So let's talk a little bit about what happened in the company between 2008 and when you ultimately went public. And why don't you jump in on that, Melissa? Well, 
I don't know that I'm the right one to start that one because I didn't join until 2009. So oh, I think okay. really <laughs> what they were looking for was me. Yeah. And, then, and then they were able to move Exactly. <laughs> Can't go public without chief legal officer. So, right, so, so let me jump in first and then Brian and Lori can talk about it. As Brian said, we saw a lot of opportunities for M&A out in the market. And so in some of the websites that we acquired were very, very good businesses, but they may have been operating out of a shoebox. I mean, it was a sole proprietor, no controls, no financial statements. Hopefully they were filing tax returns. And so they were messy from a back office standpoint, but they were really good, solid, growing, great businesses. So the, the thing that Brian did, which was awesome, is he once we raised this money, we told, he told the board, don't even talk to us about an IPO for two years because we're going to embark on an M&A strategy during that time period. And, and it's going to be messy. It's going to yep. be messy. And so, so we're going to do those things that we can do as a private company and bring in those, uh, those businesses and then clean things up and be ready, hopefully, if the markets are in two or three years. Yeah. You know, you also, I think with lots of companies, you're, you know, you're either thinking about it, preparing, what have you, uh, and you got to wait for the market conditions to be right, yeah. too. So you're always looking at, you know, who else is going public? What are the valuations? And, you know, we were, thankfully, because we'd already written, you know, NS1 um, a couple years before that, we were able to sort of spin up the real IPO extremely quickly to match the market conditions yeah. at that time, which were very good. Well, I was involved in an, in an IPO process at the same time you guys were going through yours, and I don't know if the dynamics were the same, but we made the decision in 07, 08 that we wanted to become a public company, but we knew we had to do a number of things that are very similar to what you all had done. Uh, and, and actually, this particular company went public a month after you all went public. So the timing was almost lined up completely. Let's talk a little bit about, at this end of the, at this end of the, of the, of the podium, uh, the things you had to do to, to, to get ready to become a public company. Because it's more than just getting the revenue streams. It's more than just having the financial numbers. So we had to do, you had to do a number of things in people and legal mm -hmm. and finance just to be able to go to the market with a solid company that you knew was going to perform after you went public when the financial criteria goes way up. So, Yeah, yeah I mean, we had, um, in, in the storming, forming, and norming category, people think that those are um, sort of 60-day windows. Those are really multi-year windows. So the period between 2008 and 2011 was a lot of forming. So we were developing a, a tempo of reporting from our managers. We had quarterly business reviews. Um, and we had to sort of tack left and tack right on them. We had a very inclusive culture. And then we'd look around and say, wow, there are 100 people sitting in this room. Who's out actually doing work? And so we'd dial it back and say, OK, now we're going to have a smaller group of people doing quarterly business reviews. Um, but really developing the discipline in our teams. The cadence. Yes, to set goals, to um, achieve their goals, and so forth. And a huge amount was going on on the technology front. We were integrating back ends, not only from the, um, the inventory perspective, but the content. So um, continuing to um, fold in talented people, um, make sure that our culture stayed strong and that everybody stayed um, going uh, sort of due north. Um, and then making sure that everybody could um, get the tempo. Um, so I think the forming went on even through the IPO, um, and, the, and the IPO forced us to take it to the next level because having to document everything for Sarbanes-Oxley, having to um, uh, you know, check all of our enterprise risk portfolios you know, for Melissa, it, it really raised everybody's awareness throughout the organization and gave everybody the accountability mm -hmm. um, to make sure that their part of the world was um, tucked in and in order. Um, and that was a non-trivial task, but it was a constant um, attention. How about from a legal perspective? Yeah. I Came mean, in in 09. Yes. So there was a lot of education that we had to do just across the entire organization. It was a bit of a challenge. We had employees, you know, in Europe and outside of the U.S. who had never worked for a public company or a U.S.-based company. And so... Um, you know, we were small enough then that me and my team were able to go and actually train all of the employees in person. And this really enabled us to get trust and, um, you know, buy-in from the employee organization um, as a whole. But it was also changing our mindset and even among the executive team, just getting used to what would it be like to be a public company. So I kind of played this game with them, like, let's pretend we're public. Okay, Brian, when you were, you know, 
talking to the employees at our team meeting this morning, you shared all of this data. As a public company, we may not want to do that because there's risks that our you know, non-public information would get out and it would leak to analysts and that sort of thing. So we had a bunch of efforts like Did that. Did you going make on. him do it, mock investor calls? It, it, Huh. Like that. I think we started doing that, you know, closer to the time frame, but it was yeah. a good problem to have because Brian and the team wanted to be, you know, sharing and giving lots of information to the employees. So we had to do sort of like a, yeah. a, so you a be balance. Careful. You, yeah. have to, you have to be more careful right. when you become a public company about exactly. what you share. And right. So, share. so Carl's, Absolutely. Carl's mantra, which he said every day was, we don't want to see this on the front of the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> and that, that was one. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a really great way to have everybody think twice about what they're doing. Right. Yeah. And I and I was always saying things and then and then getting slapped back. <laughs> um, I never we, slapped. We had, I mean, in particular, one of the corporate culture things that we had instilled in the company pretty early on in 2007 is, you know, this feeling that because we have a global diverse organization and growing that communication on, you know, on strategy, on sort of tactics during the quarter and things like that were really critical. And so we ended up building in our corporate headquarters um, in Austin a, a studio effectively with, you know, cameras and screens. Uh, and, and we had this 1950s kitchen table that would seat about 12 people. And, and, and so we would every Friday um, at 8 o'clock, um, or was it 8.30, 8 o'clock, we would, uh, the management, yeah. whoever was there from the senior leadership team would sit in this thing for an hour and we would just talk about what was going on in the company. People could ask questions. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to ask them anonymously, Lori had a laptop and people mm -hmm. would send questions into her. Uh, and, and so, you know, part of the challenge was that this meeting was broadcast everywhere. And, and it was also taped because we had a lot of customer service people who might have to be on the phones at 8 o'clock and they could watch that later. And we used to be just full on with information in this because I just always felt keeping people informed is better. And so it was a little tricky once we were public to have to walk that fine line. There are many, you know, 7.30 meetings before the 8 o'clock meetings. <laughs> exactly, um, yeah. We'd love to talk about that. Brian, you can't talk about the fact that we're about to close an M&A deal in three days. Like, you know, and it was you hard. Sing, you could sing about it, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would sing about it for sure. <laughs> so I'm getting this picture that before you'd have all these meetings, this team here would sit down with you and make sure that they had the rope around you for what you could say and couldn't say because it changes when you go public. It's totally different. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. One thing yeah. we did though is we just we made the choice to classify everyone as an insider. And what this meant was, you know, when we were public at various points through the year, nobody could trade their options. And there was some heartburn about that, but we that was the right choice for us as a company because it enabled us to share more with the employees. And it's pretty unusual, right? I mean, we did it because we had a process of being very inclusive with information. And, right. and I remember that being a big decision for us yeah. too. We're either going to have to cut back on what we say or everybody's going to have to be locked up. Yep. I, I, I think we made the right choice, yeah. but who knows? Absolutely, absolutely. All right, so now we're flash forward. Company starts up 05, 06 in that time frame, goes from zero revenue. Give the audience just a little perspective on what the financials looked like when you did go public, kind of revenue, run rates, cash flow, just so they have a sense of what happened between 06 and 11. Yeah, so, so when we went public, I think that, that our trailing 12-month revenue was about $170 million or something like that. So it was pre pretty big, and we were generating, you know, 30%, 40% EBITDA margins, you know, so, so we were generating a lot of cash. The revenue was, was, um, was really high. We and, were, and free cash flow was about 35 Yeah, it was about the same as, as EBITDA. Well. Yeah, and, and when, you know, fast forwarding, so we just continued to grow at 20, and, 20 to 35%, you know, year to year for the next five years in a row. So we would continue to grow. So some people looked at the story and said, well, you had a lot of M&A, so, so what's your real growth rate? Well, the key was, even though we did have a roll-up strategy in the early days, we were buying companies that were also growing fast. So we were not just adding new websites and new businesses, but we were adding businesses that were also growing really fast. 
And so the, the whole ship was just really growing at, at high rates for a very long period Did of time. Did you worry that your value would be lower because so much of it was inorganic growth at the start? We, we, wor we worried that may be a question. Yeah. And so what we could do is we went back and we were able to provide in the S1, I don't remember exactly yeah. what the numbers were, but we said if you stripped out just the pure M&A piece of it, that the year that we added it, the real organic growth was X. And so we put that actually in the document so people would understand that fundamentally the entire business was really organically growing really, really fast. Yeah, and I mean the company will do, you know, very close to a billion dollars this year. I think the last quarter was 230 million, something like that. And I remember we went back and we added up the revenue of all the acquisitions yeah. of all the companies we bought when we bought them, and it was about 70 million. So, so in the end, we were right. able to point out to investors, it, the organic yeah. growth is what the whole story is about. You know, we used acquisitions as a means to. Yeah, end. the good news is you bought companies that had fast growth rates. Right. So it had yeah. an inherent fast growth rate that was yeah. consistent with. The, yeah, yeah. And we had an M and I criteria around that. Carl and I had a very fixed set of criteria in terms of the multiple we would pay, the growth rate of the companies, what their market position, what you had to be one or two in your market. Uh, if it was under 30%, we wouldn't look at it. If it was 40%, we would definitely do it. Uh, and then we had we had kind of a range of uh, values as well. Most of our deals we probably did between seven and 10 times free cash flow, something like that. And of course, Humboy ended up trading at you know, 25 times free cash yeah. flow, so it was right. a good trade-off. Good arbitrage there, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. So, all right, so company goes public. All of a sudden, you're a public company. What kind of happens? to the culture of the company when you go public? Well, um, since we had been, pre we had, we had been uh, together as a team for a long time, so we were worried that we would see um, uh, people start to uh, leave the company um, because uh, over, 50 million, over, over 50 of our employees um, were uh, targeted to make about a million dollars or more um, in that IPO. And that's a, a significant level of our director and above population. And so, you know, we're in Austin, the cost of living here is good, you know, there's always an option to go hang out on the lake, you know, and so we're like, okay, how many people are actually going to leave? Um, and so Brian and I talked about it for almost a year leading up to it, and he said, well, what are we going to do? Everybody knows this is coming, everybody's looking at their equity, everybody's doing the math. Um, and we decided to just have an open conversation with our directors and above and say, hey, if this is a choice that you want to make, then we support you, just let us know. You know, let us know, you know, what your timing is. We'd like to have two to three months notice so that we can get somebody ramped up to um, make sure that there is a smooth handover. But absolutely, if you want to go live in Mauritius, we support you. You know, and, and that was a true story. And that was a true story. <laughs> um, and it was, you know, a sort of French tax. But anyway, we digress. Um, you know, as it turned out, probably um, fewer than five people took us up on it because as part of that conversation, we were also talking about what the next phase entailed. And we really did frame the IPO as a financing event, an event that will allow us to continue growing. And we had plenty of things beyond that horizon for people to click into as developmental opportunities and, and to click into for their growth and, and for their professional careers. Um, and I would constantly run holding power spreadsheets against competitive offers because we were, um, everybody was coming. So I would say, okay, here's your holding power. Assume 10% stock growth. Here's that company. How much, how likely are they to get the same growth in their stock as we're likely to get in our stock over the next five years? And, you know, here you run the two model comparisons. It was probably the most aggressive sort of re-recruiting strategy um, a company would entail, but I would literally go to people with their offer you know, our um, holding power and say, uh, here, you know, run it out over seven years and decide where you'd rather be. And people offered to, um, to, to stay and they opted in. You know, for those who did leave, um, uh, you know, there are three people that I can think of who left. You know, they're happier, you know, and we had someone to, um, you know, they were unhappy to begin with. It didn't have to do with their wealth. It had to do with, you know, sort of, you know, their span of control and, you know, sort of their personalities and so forth. And we were able to bring in good people to, um, to backfill them. I, I think we were also fortunate to be in Austin, too, with mm -hmm. a good chunk of our corporate staff. Because if we had been in Silicon Valley, I guarantee you, a lot of people, you know, engineering level talent and stuff like that would have flown for the next IPO opportunity. But, you know, in Austin at the time, you know, at least for sort of consumer internet, there was HomeAway and Retail Me Not, which I also sat on the board of at the time. 
Uh, and that was it. And so it wasn't like our people had the kinds of options. I mean, what we found is we hired in a ton of people to Austin from other places, including Europe. And to a person, anyone who got to this town did not want to leave. Like yeah. it was, you know, yeah, it's, exactly. it's got that kind of holding power. So yeah. it's a real benefit of just being here with a public company. Definitely. I, I, I want to add that, um, you know, as Lori mentioned, you know, they were having we were having conversations about it leading up to the IPO. But I distinctly remember when we were actually on the IPO roadshow, you and Carl um, spending some time, and we were brainstorming, and particularly, it's it's. The money is the money, but, but employees want to be excited and enthusiastic and they want to feel like that they're going to win, win the race or achieve a great goal. And so we came back and y'all were brainstorming while we were on the, the road show and it was like a month later we came up with, we're going to hit a million listings by such and such date. And there were like two or three things that were very aspirational that were like five years out. In five years we're going to have five this million listings. Billion in revenue. The, whatever stuff. it was, yeah. I can't even remember. It actually didn't matter what it was at the time. <laughs> is why I can't remember it now. But it was very aspirational, and it got people excited for the next chapter. And I think that's the thing you have to do emotionally. And and I think that Brian did a great job with the with the teams because otherwise it, there's a little bit of this weird kind of letdown. You know, like you've you've achieved a goal along the way with going public, but that's not the end. So how do you get people thinking? the next and and I actually found that the turnover was, was and the, the turnover and people leaving at least for me and my team actually took place two or three years later when essentially we were just getting poached by everyone in Austin you know that were like thinking they were going to go public and so at that point at least on the, the finance and, yeah. and kind of operations side a, a smaller company looking to go public would say those you know those people at Humway they've done an M&A they've done growth they've done an IPO or whatever and so it became actually harder for, for us on my side two or three years later than it was right at the IPO. Makes sense. All right so let's shift or pivot a little bit let's talk about the board right so I guess when you started it was probably you Carl and somebody from AV. Well that any, was about any, it. anybody who put in over 30 million in capital wanted to be on the board right, so, right. It was, so, so it was yeah. AV it was a firm called Redpoint so okay. it was the original two founders and then you know obviously when TCV came in they got a seat and when IVP came in they got a seat so we I mean it was a very venture heavy board yeah. for the first yeah. um, and it was you and several Carl? years or was it just you uh, I was really yeah it was both of us were on the board yeah all right so it started out it started it's basically a six or seven person board yeah it was heavily driven by venture capital um, and each time you included a new investor that made 30 mil, put 30 million bucks into the company, you'd give them a board seat. It's kind of like the minimum table stakes to be able to get a board seat. And that's great, but then you're going to think about becoming a public company, and that really changes the, the, the dynamic and the construction of that. Yeah. But before we go to that, all right, let's just talk about what the board was like in the early days in terms of, 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 of keeping you on the right path, of making sure that they were participating the way you wanted them to, to help you. Just talk about that, you know, what that board was like and how it interacted. Yeah, I mean, listen, the, we had a range of talent on the board. Let's just say they're all sort of MBA financial guys yeah. from the beginning. Uh, but some of them had very direct M&A, uh, private equity, you know, debt-driven experience. Others were sort of pure venture. I would say the venture guys in general are a lot more sensitive to some of the operating issues in the company. They deal with a lot of personnel issues and team issues and things of that nature. Whereas the guys from the private equity side were very like shoulder to shoulder with us when we were buying a company, helping us literally put the spreadsheets together yeah, in some cases to know exactly how to financially structure these deals. I mean. It, you know, people ask me, you know, what was the hardest thing about the board and stuff like that. We actually, HomeAway um, beat its numbers every quarter since the day it was founded. It, we were all continuously surprised at how well we would do, and we'd get more aggressive with our forecasts and we'd always beat. Because we would always beat, the board was a piece of cake. I mean, they were just <laughs> incredibly happy with what was going on. And so they were more like, how can we help? you do what you're already doing that we like you know mm -hmm. and, and and so we had a a very good relationship with those people and 
and, and most of them I had had prior relationships with too, so we had a really good working rapport. Mm -hmm. So meet or beat your numbers uh, is a, it oh, it's great it's relationships yeah. with it's the everything. board. Yeah. No, 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 really. Oh, no, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, it makes everything and when, easier. Yeah. And then yeah. when you're not meeting and beating the numbers, undersell, it's not over deliver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, do you guys want to jump in on that, or kind of the early stage, of, early days of the board? No, I think that I think that's that that's characterizes it um, nice. I mean, they they were helpful. They weren't overly. Um, we, we set up good reporting to them early on, and so as long as. You know, on my end, we were giving them the information they needed on the cadence they needed it. It was fine. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now we're flash forward. We're going to go public, or you're going to go public, and you got to kind of modify your board because you got audit committees. You need independent directors, et cetera, so forth. Talk about that. Yeah. Um, so sure. You. I mean, you've got to have independence on your committees, and so there's once you know you're going to go public. You have to start making that shift, get a few of the financial guys off the board, which is always tricky because everybody, we had a really fun board. We had a great time every quarter when we were together, so nobody wanted to leave the board. We ended up almost doing it by capital commitment. Like there was one venture firm that sold its stake, or most of its stake, and we said, okay, you know, you're going because you, know, you sold your stake. But, but, but then we had to go out and recruit some independent board members, and we did it. We didn't do it overnight, you know, we, we did it on a cadence of, you know, adding a new person sort of every three to four months. We used a search firm for one, we used relationships with our board that our board had for some of the others. Um, but we really recruited very strategically for certain strengths that the company was lacking. So one of the first guys we brought on was this uh, guy, Lanny Lattingen, who ended up being, Baker. I mean, Lanny Baker, so how do I say Lanny? He's a di different friend. So Lanny Baker um, uh, came on to assist Lynn by being the chairman of the audit committee. Yep. And that guy was just, he was unbelievable. You may yeah. want to describe how much that helped you. But. Yeah, so, so he had, he, he came from, in his early career, a, a Wall Street background. So, so he had actually worked on, on Wall Street, Smith Barney or something like that. I don't even remember where it was. But then he was a CFO at Monster in the early days. And so he had been in the seat for many years as a private and a public company. And at the time that we that he came onto our board, he was the CEO of Zip Realty. So he was still in um, online space, but had great CFO background as well as Wall Street background. And so and he was just solid as a rock too. So so he was the kind of audit committee chair, um, much like I have now with Bill, that um, that we can you can pick up the phone and call and just say and just talk to him you know this is what's going on you know ha give me some some feedback and he was particularly helpful to me sometimes the ir um the, the investor relations officer and i would, would call him and say you know we're thinking about this messaging because he still had that that messaging background too and he was a great one to um to call and because he feedback. was he was a sell side analyst wasn't yeah. he for some yeah. period yeah yeah, yeah. so so he, he was he was great I, I do believe that we saw the board um the independents come on very strategically. And so we would look at the board when there was an opportunity to bring on someone and say, what do we need that's missing? Is it help in marketing? Is it yeah. help in product? Is it help in, um, in Europe? And so there yeah. was a particular time. Yeah, we brought, we, I mean, the next person we brought right. on, um, Simon Breakwell, yeah. was, you know, the ex-head of everything outside of the U.S. for Expedia. And he was retired and in London. Uh, but he could actually work with our teams in London. Right. He really understood at that time we were looking for some experts. We, we were starting to make the transition to online booking and creating more of a, you know, what you'd consider to be a typical sort of online travel company. Uh, and we didn't really have that expertise on the marketing front, on the systems front, and other things. So we brought in Simon specifically for that reason, yeah. and, and he was terrific. And then, and then um, we got to a stage where we really thought we had to sort of explode our brand marketing and our relationships with our customers. Um, a, a huge part of our customer base were women as decision makers. Uh, and you know, for that, we, we found an amazing woman named uh, Tina Sharkey, who was one of the founders of iVillage, um, ended up uh, doing a company called Baby Center that got bought by Johnson & Johnson, or it was done internally within Johnson yeah. & Johnson, it became mm -hmm. a huge company, the biggest sort of baby products site in the country. And she was just uh, an expert on yeah. branding and marketing consumer services to women. And so again, we, you know, we were, we were very, very specific about mm -hmm. who we hired. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. So you're describing 
a transition of primarily financial, a prim primarily a financial focus with VCs and private equity with founders to this world post IPO that had a lot of operational yeah. expertise. Mm -hmm. And they probably also became more involved working with all, all of you, mm -hmm. either as sounding boards or helping you out and doing things mm -hmm. as you became public because the challenges mm -hmm. were greater, the world was greater, et cetera. So let's shift a little bit from that into, um, you know, there's a, I think on the tables, there's the Harvard Business Review case study on Home Away, <coughs> or is it on the tables? Yeah. yeah, which I hope you all will take and read, all right? Uh, but as the company evolved, uh, you know, you, uh, you, talk, you referred to it a little bit earlier, but we'll come back and talk about it now, is initially got started as a classified site, and then you wanted to move to a different business model, mm -hmm. and that's what the focus is in this Harvard Business Review article. Talk about why you all thought you needed to do that and some of the challenges that existed, because obviously it was not an easy thing to do, and others that had tried to move to this commission model had failed miserably. They, so talk about yeah, that. They, they had, but there was a new company on the horizon called Airbnb that was growing very, very quickly, and that was a straight-up bookings-based model, 100% with commission on top of it. Actually, what was unique about Airbnb is they charged a fee both to the owners and the travelers on every <laughs> transaction. Home away for us was always travelers should be able to access everything we have for free. That was our philosophy. Um, we ended up, I mean, the company today actually does pretty much what Airbnb does. It charges both owners and travelers. We, we uh, you know, waited many, many years for the time to be right to make our properties online bookable. As it turned out, most of our owners didn't want that. They didn't like that. They viewed, and, and it was really, I think, the, 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 the genius moment uh, in the beginning of the company that we had was understanding that owners and travelers renting houses wasn't like a hotel transaction. If you were a traveler, um, you had questions. You know, do you have a crib? Do you have towels and things like that? And if you're an owner, you want to know, are these people going to come party in my house? Who are they? How old are they? And so the ability for those people to talk to each other was central to the business. And as you mentioned, many, many other companies as HomeAway was growing tried to jump in and do a better HomeAway than HomeAway. And they all failed because the people participating in the marketplace didn't necessarily want it. That said, you know, times change. And in tech, you have to always, you know, play to the next audience. We start, started having these people who grew up with cell phones in their hands and grew up with Amazon and grew up with online booking. And then Airbnb comes along, and they've now made it really easy to just go online and book. And so we, it, it was a bit of a, OK, the timing's right, because these guys are proving it can be done, um, we are going to be in big trouble long term if we don't go to this because HomeAway, we, it was a subscription-based business. So you just paid an annual fee, essentially, to list on our sites. Um, but that annual fee, and this is what people loved about us, was about 3% of the revenue that we generated. Airbnb was taking 12% of the revenue they generated. And so while they were still smaller than us at the time, you played that out and said, well, wait a second. If, if they're making 4x on a transaction, they can spend 4x on marketing, um, and we're not going to be able to keep up with them. And so that's really what spurred that transition. And it wasn't easy because, again, our owners didn't want it. So we had yeah. to ease our way into it. Uh, today, I think probably 95% of the properties are online bookable on the site. I mean, just to, to you know, give an example of how um, old school the owners were. I mean, a lot of the companies that we bought not only kept their receipts in shoe boxes, but they also ran magazines. And so, you know, they're running a magazine with listings and we are like, well, we're shutting down the magazine. And they're like, oh, what? You know, why would you take it out of print? You know, and I um, went through the customer support area, you know, in the early years, people were mailing us photos of their property to upload for the site. U.S. Postal Service. I mean, yeah. so this is, these people are, um, have been doing this for 20 years. They are putting their you know, pictures up at the local laundromat. Um, we are a little bit different than the local laundromat, and they don't want to change. And they were very vocal about it. And you know, Christine helped us a lot with that. Uh, we had a huge amount of advocacy for owners. Like They're the ones who are paying the bills. 
but actually taking your customers with you into a new market reality was a very hard thing to do, um, and it was um, not always easy. I mean, Brian got lots of um, angry phone calls. Yeah, I mean, you may also want to talk about just the, the financial side was tough because the market loved a subscription business, and, this, and you can talk about some of the accounting implications, but that was a pretty big change. Yeah, so um, having recurring revenue, um, of course, increases your ability to forecast, and if you can, you know, forecast appropriately, then you can satisfy the market. So the market loved our cash flow model, and those subscriptions, in our case, were paid 12 months in advance, generally. Yeah. And so we had, we were collecting cash way ahead of revenue, and it was very um, predictable, visible, and all that. So, so that... That, the market loved that as a financial model, but of course the market wants their cake and eat it too, right? They also, we would spend a lot of time, they, they were hearing about Airbnb and they were like, well, why don't you take a higher, they wanted us to take the higher take rate. You know, in the perfect they world, they want- They a subscription model at 12%. Exactly. Double our subscription. Yeah, they wanted yeah. us to double, triple or whatever. Four times the revenue. And, and, and so they, they were pushing in those areas and in, in the early days, we actually spent a fair amount of time, as Lori described, we were trying to describe who our owners were and, and how the people needed to talk to each other and all of that because many of those on the investment side, uh, a lot of them were young and already online booking themselves and they just couldn't understand why you shouldn't be able to go online and pick a house and just book it and, and move on and so we had to spend some time describing, well imagine that if this was your mother's home in the Hamptons, do you think that she would allow you to do this? Once you gave them some real time examples, they, they understood it, but we were really educating the yeah. market early yeah. on. And, and then in, in later on, we were actually making an evolution of our business yeah. model. But with, but with respect to that accounting issue, I, I would say one of the key drivers of selling to Expedia was the fact that we had made a decision in a two-year period to turn the site from subscription to online booking. Yeah. As Lynn, you mentioned when you're in the online booking world, now you're, you're recognizing revenue as bookings are made. Right. And it's a very seasonal business and yeah. it's a whole sort of different kettle of fish. And we wouldn't be able to predict yeah. our revenue and earnings well enough to get the valuation we'd earned in the past. If you bury it in a much bigger company like Expedia, you have a little wiggle room on that stuff. Nobody's going to get concerned that January was a big month and March was a small month, which are, you know, things that would happen in our business. And so that, that, just that financial yeah. equation ended up being a big driver on yeah. the so that's of the business. A, that's a good segue. Yeah. And you know, the general point here is the market loves predictability. They yeah. love yeah. recurring revenue models, especially one where you collect the cash 12 months in advance. That's what we, that, that was one of the reasons Dell was so successful in its early days. Yeah. It collected the cash ahead. All right. So that ultimately, or that question around what business model you have uh, led s sooner or later to considering your strategic options to either continue to run as a standalone independent company or look for options. So why don't you guys talk a little bit about the timing of that and what ultimately drove that decision to sell? Gosh. You guys looking at me? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, anyway, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it, sure. was, it, was, it was a very interesting conversation because all of our executives were really involved in it and everybody had really um, different opinions. You know, so I think that you know, one of the things that, um, that we did do is we talked about it a lot, we looked at a lot of the alternatives, we modeled all of the alternatives, we tried to understand the risks, and then you know, Brian's job, you know, which you know, he did every year, was really to take the best ideas from every person and synthesize them into something that was you know, better. You know, and so that's, that's what that process was like. It, it felt sometimes like we were, um, you know, continually talking about the same thing. It was probably about a year, you know, maybe a little over a year that we were, you know, talking about it openly. I think Brian probably started thinking about it earlier, but we were thinking about it from, you know, the product perspective, from the systems perspective, from the tax perspective, from the talent perspective, you know, from every single perspective we could, um, including, you know, should we consolidate Europe? You know, if we didn't consolidate Europe, what would we do? You know, should we, um, you know, go, you know, who is, you know, what are we doing against Airbnb? Because we'd been in denial for a long time about, you know, sort of how fast they were growing, even though, you know, it was, you know, obvious. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, you know so, so while we were a, a year or so, in, you know, talking about changing the business model, 
The, the other thing that was going on in, in the world is that this form of travel was really catching on. So, so we weren't necessarily talking every day about being acquired at all. We were talking about growing the business and evolving the business model. And then all of a sudden, the big guys, the Expedia, are kind of waking up and realizing travelers, families and groups, like this sort of travel, you know, especially, especially for vacations and when you have a, a, a bunch in your group as opposed to one or two traveling, Airbnb coming on the scene was further validation of what we were doing. So, you know, you know, by the fall when, you know, it was, you know, unsolicited, we were sort of tapped, there was also, it was because there was awakening of the market where it was becoming more mainstream to, to have this kind of travel. And when it became more mainstream to have this kind of travel, large, large companies that were already in travel, now all of a sudden they're saying, okay, maybe we want to be in this game also. And then, you know. Thoughts. Then we talked, go ahead, take it from there. Um, what you, I'm well, saying. I'm sorry. I was just saying, so, so then, we, we, then at that point, everything is documented in the, in the legal documents that company A did this and company B did this and company C did this. And essentially, we were a very, very attractive target for large travel players because we had made this industry mainstream. And they were probably feeling an opportunity to um, acquire us so that they can compete with Airbnb. So that's kind of what yeah. kicked because, off be, the be, process. Be, because Airbnb is essentially unviable at that point. Right. You know, it has, it's still to this day, this kind of wacky private valuation, especially for a company that's never uh, earned a dollar, dollar in right. net income and still hasn't to this day. Uh, but that was, <laughs> but listen, that was a tough thing for us to compete with yeah. as a company because they, they were just free spent. They had so much capital that they just didn't care about their financials. Yeah. And of course, we're a public company and we're valued based on our financials. So it wasn't like we could just turn around and you know, invest $10 million in marketing in Asia, uh, but they were doing that. They were they investing could, yeah. $100 yeah. million dollars in marketing in Asia. And so again, this notion of sort of creating a bigger pillar of, of strength and global presence and, uh, you know, and capital uh, just it made sense for our shareholders it made sense for us I mean I, I was always you know my job was to always think about the shareholders and that means you know in the end you're thinking about stock price and not where it is today but where you think it's going to be over the next year two or three the fundamental analysis you know we would go through with the bankers was looking at you know, our high and low income scenarios and run it five years out and discount that back and look at what the stock price would be under certain conditions at that time. And then compare that to, um, you know, offers that we were entertaining. And of course, you mm -hmm. know, it, 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 if, you, if you get an offer from a company then it's in excess of where you think your stock's gonna wind up three years from now, you gotta take a pretty hard look at that. And, and because it is, at least for our shareholders, kind of a risk-free transaction. Yeah, they, they, you know, it just eliminates a lot of uncertainty for them. Yeah. So, from a how about from a personal perspective, you've been with it for eleven years, eleven years, seven years, eight years. It's a long time in this yeah. environment. Is, was that yeah. part of the component too? That yeah. uh, you know, if we're in this, we're in it for another five or six years. Honest, honestly, yes, I would say. I mean, it's uh, it, it was it was uh, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of travel more than anything else because we. You know, had companies all over the globe, and you know, and when you have a family and other things, those things start to add up uh, and make life a bit difficult. And so, yeah, there was part of me that was that was a little bit tired and um, and and ready to move on. I didn't need to jump immediately. I ended up staying on about a year uh, after we signed the deal. But at least for me, that was a motivator. And you know, everybody in this panel uh, has left the company since and pretty much did right after the acquisition. We all so. left on the same day, remember? Yeah, that's yes. right. <laughs> well, that was you. They left you. Yeah. Well, yeah. We're all alone. It was, it, was yeah. it was particularly troubling because I was very proud of the, of the um, gender diversity that we had in our leadership team. Uh, and as it turned out, you know, when companies get consolidated, there are certain yeah. positions that get consolidated immediately. You know, you don't need two CFOs, you don't need two chief legal officers, you don't need two heads of HR. And all of those positions were the women on our leadership team. So we went overnight from a pretty diverse group to, you know, a bunch of guys. Uh, and that was, that, was a, that was a difficult thing for me. 
Well, it also speaks why there should be a lot more women on boards. Absolutely. You know, right yeah. right yeah. to that particular point. Well, we just have a, a, a few minutes left. I do have one audience from the question. I'm going to add a second to it. You guys can address it any, in any way you want. Is, you know, what was your biggest mistake in terms of if you had a chance to do it again, what would you do? And what's the, the most beautiful memory that you have about that time together? Mm -hmm. I mean, I can start on that. I don't know if it was a mistake, but I think one thing that we could have done better was that we grew so quickly, both you know organically and through acquisition. We didn't always have somebody who was being mindful about how do we grow smarter. So later in the company's life cycle, we actually had a project where we looked at efficiencies. So how do do we have duplicative systems? Do we have you know too many offices in too many countries? Is there a way that we can improve our bottom line? And I think that's one thing that we could have done better along the way is to be mindful about, you know, how do we do that more efficiently? And then as far as a favorite memory. Yeah, you most yeah, thing you can um, take away from it. So we had a bunch of really, really fun marketing campaigns. And one of them was Let's Stay Together. And we worked with Al Green <laughs> on that. And that was the theme song for my wedding. And I got to meet Al Green. And that was a highlight not only of... Home away, but that was my a life. Fun night. There, awesome. I mean, there were a lot of amazing yeah, memories yeah, like totally. that we come back to. Probably for me, the the, the I, I have very few regrets about anything that happened at Home Away. It was a dream ride, and the team was fantastic, and it was fun. Um, I, you know, probably the biggest thing I'll kick myself for is not paying enough attention to Airbnb really early in their life. I mean. I don't know if we would have had the chance to buy them, but it's possible that in the early days we could have bought them for $100 million or $200 million. And they were just so small, and everybody else who tried to compete with us had failed. And, and, and I just don't think, you know, I probably, for a company that was so M&A driven, paid enough attention, attention to that to segment. Uh, and then, of course, it got, the deal got away. As soon as we realized that this thing was a juggernaut, it, you know, from a valuation yeah. perspective, we couldn't keep it in pricing. Yep. Yeah. You know, I guess I think I would somewhat echo what um, Melissa said in that th there is a downside of being flush with cash. I mean, it, you, know, you make a lot of money from day one. You're, you're never really scrappy. And, and, and so there's the, the culture there what was always, I called it a bolt-on culture where, well, we'll just go buy another company. We'll just add this activity. Let's just create this new team. And so that bolt-on culture, you know, it, it, it was, it was the, the downside of, of, of riches, right? You know, and so that really, um, we, we could have done a better job along the way in that area. My, my fondest memories were um, our holiday parties. Um, we had a um, very unique thing we that at the homeway parties and that Brian would... Um, he had a song that he would sing, I'd play the guitar and sing a song that he would write that kind of would poke fun at, at things that were going on either at the company or with people or in our industry. And, and, and it, one of the things that made it really special is that even when we had a thousand people there or whatever, I mean, it, everyone was mom. I mean, this did not get out. People were not social media sending it out. I mean, it was a, it was a very safe environment. It's like no typing, no spreading this out or whatever, because it really was personal to us. And you made it really personal to us even when we had a thousand people. And the only time I was mentioned in the song, though, it was very <laughs> negatively. <laughs> Because it was all my fault that one particular year we canceled the holiday party. And that's, an whole, that's a whole other story, but I, I, I heard about that in the song. But it was a special memory every year that you did that. Yeah, and that fact is actually funny. It reminded me of that because it <laughs> comes back to the going public point. They, they had to sit me down and say, because I would never let anybody know a word of the song until the moment I got on stage. I'd usually write it sort of the week of. Uh, and... You know, there was a lot of really shocking things that would sort of come out and foul language and you name it. And, uh, and, and, and so they had to sit me down and say, listen, this year we need to know what's going to be in this thing. I don't think I'd let you see it. But I listened to you, but I didn't let you see it. Yeah, but but we, we had to be a little bit careful. But, but, so, but so we would. And those, you those, put it in your 10K. And those parties are some of my, you know, yeah. greatest memories as well. But, but I would always, before I would sing this, I'd give a you know, speech to the company, talk about the year, things like that. Uh, and, and then would specifically say, hey, 
we're a public company. You guys have always been great about this. We're a family. No, this cannot leave this room or I won't do it again next year. And that was enough of a motivator yeah. to keep it quiet. And I don't think anything ever got yeah. out. No mm -hmm. video, yeah. nothing. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Um, so I think that if we'd, um, we, we were always balancing between the risk and growth curve. So in Europe, for example, we had all of these offices. They were generating a lot of revenue. The mantra was don't mess it up. You know, VRBO, monolithic site, don't mess it up. But that don't mess it up mentality, which is great for risk management, and obviously, you know, these were growing companies, didn't allow us to make tough decisions to consolidate and, and you know, to Melissa and Lynn's point, you know, do the right thing to, to build the right structure for scale in the future. So we ended up, and Melissa and I probably spent a year and a half merging two French entities, you know, and I mean, that's fun. Like merging, <laughs> like, I mean, it was super fun. And Lynn and Brian thought they might get arrested when they went to France and, you know, all of these things. But if we had done it earlier, you know, if we had migrated VRBO onto our platform before we went public, we would have had a whole development team that was a lot less stressed out. But, you know, we were public and we were moving about $150 million on one particular weekend in June. And I could literally, like, see the medical bills go up, you know, as the employees um, freaked out. Um, the, the holiday song is one of my favorites. I think that you know always makes makes my heart burst. But another moment, um, I mean, I had this is one specific moment with one specific employee in the hallway. I um, mean, this is sort of a vote for wellness programs, and he came up to me and he said, you know, that wellness program we did, and it was like one of these green juice sort of Austin things. He's like, you changed my life. You know, and it wasn't about money, and it wasn't about anything. It was about you know, caring about the employees and making sure that, you know, they put their health first. And so completely out of the blue, not intended, but, yeah. you know, I think that um, this whole team changed a lot of lives um, in a lot of different ways. And that was, you know, the thing that makes it my favorite. Thank you. That seems like a good place to end and we're out of time. So I would like to thank my panelists up here. You did a terrific job today. It was wonderful. Uh, a great, great answer to, to end the program. So join me in giving our panel here a big round of applause.